I'm Bill Hemmer. This is Hemmer Time. Eric Erickson, welcome. How are you, sir? I'm great. Thanks for having me. You bet. We got a lot to go through here. Listen, the fate of the nation hangs in the balance. Is is that too much of a statement? <laughs> Definitely the Senate, for sure. Okay. All right. Now, Eric Erickson, a host of the radio show, Atlanta's Evening News, broadcast WSB Radio out of Atlanta, lives in Macon, Georgia, which is Bibb County, which, you know, Eric, that's right up my alley, by the way, because I, I study this county stuff. All right. Right in the heart of the state. That's what I'm saying. You tell us today, where do these Senate races stand as of now? I think that what we're seeing as as we get through early voting is that Republicans are behind Democrats, as everyone expects would happen, uh, even into the midst of early voting. But they're not nearly as behind as they were in the general election. And that's good. Uh, The trend line suggests it's about 60-40 when in the general election, it was about a 70-30 split. And 60-40 is right where the Republicans need to be because historically in Georgia, they always turn out higher on election day than Democrats, uh, regardless of the weather. And that's getting some Republicans very confident. Uh, We're seeing tens of thousands of new voters show up who did not participate in the general. And those voters are coming from high intensity Republican areas, including some of them who have voted in the past in Republican primaries and just sent out this general election. That suggests that they're coming in favor of divided government. In fact, if you look at the exit polling in Georgia uh, from the general election, uh, an overwhelming majority of them favored divided government. And that gives the Republicans some encouragement. Mm. Why was it 70-30 then in the general election? Because you had the entirety of the Republican Party, from the state party to the president, saying don't do absentee voting, don't do early voting, show up on election day. And there were, I think, Brad Raffensperger, the Secretary of State, notes there were roughly, I want to say it was 25,000 Republicans who voted absentee ballot in the primary and then never showed up in the general election. And a lot of this was the Republicans telling people not to do it, so they listened. Wow. Okay, so now you've got this dynamic where it's been a couple of weeks now. The president's fighting these court battles. We'll see how they all wind out. Has that had an effect on early voting, or can you tell? Well, my initial reaction was that it was going to, and in fact, there was some polling done in Georgia that showed uh, there was a minority but significant minority of Republicans who just weren't going to go vote. Uh, But the president came down uh, right after the election, uh, towards the end of November, he did a rally with uh, David Perdue and Kelly Loeffler. And he made the statement that some of my friends say they're not going to go vote uh, because what happened in the presidential election said the solution here is not to go vote, but to go vote and go vote in large numbers. Uh, David Perdue quickly turned that into an advertisement that has been blasted all over the state. And it the president and the vice president showing up have really, really helped. In fact, um, in, uh, voters in Georgia who are Republicans have been getting mail pieces, myself included, in the mail uh, with a picture of smiling and waving Mike Pence with here's the website to go to to get your absentee ballot. Go do it right now. Wow. Wow. It seems like they've learned a lesson. Yeah, I, I think so. It, it was it was madness for the GOP to publicly be telling voters in Georgia not to do absentee ballots because historically the Republicans dominate the absentee ballot game in Georgia. This is the first year in a while that Democrats outpaced Republicans on absentee balloting in Georgia. And it had a lot to do with a concerted effort from the state party to the national party saying, go vote on election day, don't do absentee. Mm -hmm. Help us understand. Stacey Abrams gets a lot of attention. She ran for statewide office. Uh, She lost narrowly, but she lost. What has she done on the Democratic Party side, what has she done well? Is she getting a fair amount of credit or too much credit, in your view, Eric? You know, listen, I, I like Stacey Abrams. I, I Having the, the evening news program in Atlanta, I interviewed every single candidate, Republican and Democrat, who ran for governor in 2018. She was one of the best interviews. Very personable, very self-deprecating. I think she kind of let the election go to her head a little bit. She's not quite as self-deprecating as she had been. I actually think she's a little bit overrated. Uh, and I can give you this anecdotally, uh, her team, Fair Fight Georgia and the like, were in the run-up to the 2018 gubernatorial election in Georgia, registered 998,000 people to vote. Less than 100,000 of those people actually showed up to vote in 2018. And again, 
you know, like they say with the markets, the past is not an indicator of the future. With voters, the past is an indicator of the future. And if you're 45 and you've never voted and they finally register you to vote, the odds are you're still not going to go vote. And they made an inordinate amount of hay over the number of people they registered and have never really talked about how few of them actually showed up. And if you actually look at uh, the voter rolls in Georgia, there are about 11,000 people currently as considered pending voters in Georgia that her organization registered to vote. And the reason they're pending voters is because they got information wrong. Either their address doesn't match what's on record or their social security number doesn't. And if they aren't corrected by next year, they'll be wiped off the voter rolls altogether. Mm. You know, they talk about like, the, you know, the case in Florida from 20 years ago, uh, they, they make an example out of Florida because they reformed their election rules, right? And, you know, they kick out a winner early on the night. Texas, I think, is similar. You can make the case. You, you wonder if, if, if Georgia is now in that progression. Do you think it is? I think they're going to have to. One of the things that uh, Florida does well and uh, what the president's team didn't object to is Florida counted and secured all of their absentee ballots before Election Day. In Georgia, they process the signatures. This is one of the mythologies that has come up on the Republican side that the signatures weren't matched. They actually were. They were matched before the election, but they didn't actually open the envelopes and pull out the ballots and start counting them until Election Day, which dragged out the process for several days. Okay. In Georgia, do you have a system like in Pennsylvania where you have a ballot on the inside and an envelope on the outside and they got to match up? Is, is that how Georgia does it? Yeah, so, so the way Georgia does signature verification is all of your voter registration cards and driver's licenses are scanned and they're put, their pictures are put into a Georgia Bureau of Investigation database. So what happens is when the envelope comes back, the outer envelope has to be signed by the voter. It is matched first to the absentee ballot application to make sure they match. And then it's looked at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation database and it has to match the most recent signature, because, I mean, for example, if you've signed your voter registration card in 1980, but you've got an updated driver's license from 2015, the odds are your signature has changed. So it's got to match two of the three, the the voter registration card and the um, driver's license or the absentee ballot application. But if it doesn't match two of the three, they have to call the voter and verify it's their ballot. Is that a cured ballot then when they go back and fix it? Yes. Uh, if they have, mm. they've got, the voter has 24 hours, if it doesn't match, to come in and prove it's their val ballot. Okay. Has that always been the law or is that new in Georgia? So it, there was a court case that Stacey Abrams' group filed in court and they won the case. There was ultimately a settlement. What happened in 2018 is the Secretary of State's office decided that you not only had to sign the ballot, but you also had to write in your birth date and your address, handwritten. And if they weren't, they would throw the ballot out. That was new that year. The law says you can only throw out ballots without a signature, and there was an issue as to whether or not they could reject ballots that lack this other information. A federal judge said they couldn't. So the settlement agreement between Stacey Abrams' group and the Secretary of State was you can only throw out ballots missing a signature, and you're also going to give people 24 hours to come fix them. Uh, you notify the voter, give them 24 hours to cure it. Uh, only about, I, I want to say of the ballots that were rejected, it was a very small number of people who actually came in and cured their ballots. Less than 5,000 people uh, came in and actually bothered to sign their ballots. Less than 5,000? Yes. State, so the, you're talking several hundred thousand. Right. You're, you're talking several hundred thousand absentee ballots, and statewide, less than 5,000 never showed up to sign their ballots. So less than 5,000 of those absentee ballots were rejected. Okay. okay for perspective. So, yeah, go you, ahead. Keep going. I, we're going deep down the rabbit hole on this for a second. Go ahead. Keep going, Eric. Okay. So – in 2018, when the Secretary of State's office was rejecting address and, and birth date and all that, the rejection rate was over 1%. Mm -hmm. But in 2016, the ballot rejection rate was 0.8%. In 2020, the ballot rejection rate was 0.7%. So basically the same rejection rate in presidential election cycles. Uh, in other words, a lot of the mythology about what happened in Georgia has been overstated by Republicans uh, there are problems with our balloting process, but the signature verification is not one of them. Okay, so this is what I was driving at here. And you know it well. You know the law well and the history. Do you trust it? Yeah, I do. I Look, I was an elections lawyer in Georgia for a number of years. In fact, when we moved to electronic voting in 2000, I was actually in law school interning for the Secretary of State's office and helped them design the system and get it off the ground. It, it's actually a very good system. Uh, it, it's one where the Democrats have for years screamed that it was insecure, and now the Republicans are making the same case. 
But in both cases, when you actually get them to talk about the system, they clearly don't understand how it works. For example, in Georgia, nothing is connected to the internet. In fact, random trivia for you, Bill, the way that the official results for a county are submitted to the Secretary of State is they write them on paper, seal them in an envelope, and have a state trooper drive them to the Secretary of State's office. They don't even transmit that over the internet. Is that a good thing? Yeah, I actually think it is. So for all the people who have skepticism about the internet and hacking, we're going through this hacking crisis in the nation now with the Russians. Uh, everything in Georgia is kept offline. All the official records are completely disconnected from the internet. Mm -hmm. For the full podcast, go to foxnewspodcast.com.